Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on today, the Gadigal people of the Or Nation, and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. Thank you all for coming to OSDOC's first session this year. Um, and welcome to our OSDOC's panel. Uh, we have Jen Peedham, James Rickardson, Olivia Rousset, and Mark Davis. Um, for those of you who don't know, OSDOCS is an all-volunteer organization focused on documentaries, love of documentaries, and we put on events once a month. And you're more than welcome to join us and to participate in um, meetings that we have um, and to help create sessions like we've done tonight. Um, and we also encourage you to subscribe on our website so you can get kind of the latest of what, of what we're doing. Um, my name's Paige Livingston. Uh, tonight, uh, I wanna thank you guys again for all of you volunteering your time to be here tonight and to show clips and to talk about dangerous documentaries. Uh, we'll start tonight um, with Jen Peedham. And I need to just give you a quick warning that some of the clips that we're seeing tonight are very upsetting. Um, so uh, I will give you kind of a forewarning before they start. All right, so Jen's got to go at 7.30. She's got a screening tonight. So um, we're putting her first. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about Jen. Um, Jen is a BAFTA-nominated director known for her gripping, intimate portraits of people in extreme circumstances. Her credits include internationally renowned feature documentaries, Solo, Sherpa, and most recently, Mountain, a collaboration with the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll be seeing clips from Sherpa. Uh, Sherpa was a critically acclaimed on the international festival circuit, including Telluride Toronto, London Film Festival winning multiple awards, including the Grierson Award, Best Documentary at the BFI London Film Festival, the Australian Film Critics Circle Award, the Australian Directors Guild Award, so many, Jess. Oh, <laughs> uh, several audience awards and a BAFTA nomination in 2016. The film became the third highest grossing Australian documentary in history. Um, so welcome, Jen. And um, before, what I thought we'd do is run the trailer first. Sure. Can yeah. I just say my injury here is unfortunately oh, yeah. not from anything <laughs> intrepid. I was um, skateboarding with my children. I was trying to impress them and um, I have 13 stitches under here. <laughs> it's very suitable for dangerous documentaries. Yeah. It's foolish, not brave in any way. Were you shooting? I was actually filming myself just a little bit before, <laughs> but not when I crashed. <laughs> Thank goodness. Great. All right. Well, we're going to um, run the trailer. We Sherpa people have a great respect for that mountain. She is the mother god of the earth. Over here we climb mountain, but it's a holy place. Western people approach it as a physical challenge to see how close you can get to death. We have about 120 Sherpas or so that have died so far. The risks that people were making the Sherpas take, what is the moral justification for that? Roughing it on Mount Everest, hot towels and tea in the morning. <laughs> My father said, I wish I had never climbed this mountain. They're angry, yes, they are, for lack of respect. <laughs> Every time I send the Sherpas up in the mountain, it's like sending them off to war. I don't know who's going to come home. Pull that Sherpa off, bring him down to Halipad. 
Jadi aku tuh ingin kasih tengah kalau macam macam tengah dah jalan kalau ini. So, Jen, every time I see that, I get my palms start to sweat. <laughs> I think this is going to be a sweaty night. Um, look, I wanted you to just talk a little bit about the circumstances of um, making the film and before, and then maybe set up the avalanche scene. Yeah, so um, I, had, I had worked as a climbing camera operator sort of in my 20s on about three or four Himalayan expeditions, including one I did for Dateline um, probably in 2003. And... I'd always had the idea of this film in my head. Um, and as the years went on, it became increasingly apparent that tensions were rising on Everest. And in fact, when we were doing the pitch trailer for this film, the day that we were due to start cutting, um, a fight broke out on Everest between Sherpas and foreigners. And so it just seemed like the right time to tell this story and to follow an Everest expedition from the Sherpas' point of view. And that was the idea I had you know, the main character I'd known for 10 years. Um, and we'd climbed together on three mountains. And so I kind of went into this, you know, expecting one kind of film and, and the danger that that I anticipated generally happens uh, on summit day. Um, you know, there's a lot of danger before there and particularly in the Kumbu Icefall, but, but you know, what I, expect, what, what I expected to happen was absolutely not what happened. Um, and so kind of leading up to the moment that I guess you, it's not a spoiler because you see it in the trailer, there was a, um, the worst disaster in the history of Everest happened um, probably on our, I think we'd been at base camp for about three or four nights. Um, and so a lot of my crew had, were barely acclimatised. Some of us had gotten there quicker than others and depending on how people were acclimatising. And we were, um, we were filming the, the Sherpa team who were leaving to climb through the Kumbu Icefall for their first load of what would probably be 30 trips through that icefall, the Kumbu Glacier. So it was a big kind of moment and we knew that it was dangerous and, and obviously we were, that was one of the big points in the film that the Sherpas have to share a disproportionate part of the risk. Um, and so we were up at two o'clock in the morning filming them do their beautiful rituals that they do before they go off into the night. Um, they climb at night, don't they? They climb at night because um, the it the in the cold of the night the ice fall is more stable mm -hmm. when the sun hits the ice fall it starts to become unstable and and there's avalanches all the time and you hear them all the time so we we sort of got back to bed um probably about three or four uh, probably four a.m um i woke up at six when i was writing a shot list you know because I'm in a state of panic because i had a whole crew there and knew that I had to deliver and had a whole lot of stuff to do and I was sitting in my tent and I heard this another big avalanche. But this one really seemed to come in the direction of, of the icefall and I had a radio um, in my tent and I heard suddenly a, a bit of an explosion of radio traffic and then one of the Sherpa um, cooks came to my tent um, and told me what had happened and I woke up the crew and, and we just grabbed cameras. Um, and started filming so and I guess this is do you want to show that yeah this yep. is taking us up to the next clip
Yeah, so that was intense. I was just remembering watching that, that I did a session, I reckon it was about two days after I got back from that trip. Um, I don't know if anyone was there, but it was, it certainly, it brings it back to me every time. It was a very intense um, day and... Um, I mean, what my immediate concern was our Sherpa team. So we had two, <coughs> two Sherpa cameramen that we'd been on a separate trip and recruited and trained, and they were filming for us and, and wearing those GoPros in the, in the icefall. Um, that particular icefall that you see over that camera wasn't the avalanche. It was just a smaller snowfall. Um, so our, our crew were all okay and we were able to ascertain that fairly quickly, but that was, you know, you just have a, a sick feeling in your stomach. Um, and I remember just grabbing the camera and Renan, my, one of my main camera guys, who's a professional mountaineer, also grabbed a camera, the sound recordist, had the wherewithal to start recording that audio, which was critical. Um, and we just sort of spent the rest of the day kind of capturing what we could and, and it was just the death toll just, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the day and sort of towards the end of the day, there were still people missing, but we knew it was at least 14, 14 dead. And, um, you know, it was, I mean, I don't know quite what to focus on, but for me, I mean, it was highly emotional, um, but it was also for my crew, a number of whom hadn't been to Everest Base Camp before or even, um, so some of them were professional mountaineers, but some of them weren't. And for them, they were terrified. They had families at home. You know, we were getting phone calls because suddenly, you know, the news hit Australia and and because I could see people putting stuff on Facebook, so I quickly sent out a message to let everyone know that, that we were safe. Um, but there was a lot of fear with the team. And then because of that fight that had happened the year before, crazily, a lot of foreigners, including some of the people in my crew, were very scared that the Sherpas were going to start throwing rocks at us for some crazy reason, which wasn't going to happen. Do you want to just briefly talk about the fight that happened that created the tension that's so much part of this film? Yeah, so um, in 2013, um, the, there was a Sherpa team, it's, it's called the rope fixing team. So these days when you climb Everest, you follow a, a rope, a fixed rope, all the way to the summit. Um, there's no sort of free climbing or anything like that. And there's a team of highly qualified Sherpas, including my main character. So some of these Sherpas will climb Everest twice just in one season. And so these Sherpas were fixing the ropes and a team of uh, professional climbers came past, one of them an Italian mountaineer with a very kind of, you know, some big egos there. And um, they dislodged some ice down as they were climbing above the Sherpa rope fixing team some ice went down and fell on the Sherpas the Sherpas started shouting at them one of the, Ita the Italian guy called them um, I shouldn't swear because there's children in the room but a very bad word which means to insult the mother goddess if you can imagine what that word would be and it just the Sherpas you, you know you mm. do not insult the mountain when you're on the mountain it's a, like a hugely um, sacrosanct thing and so they down tools went back down to their camp and and a kind of full-on brawl broke out 
Um, but it was really instigated by one young Sherpa who was the one throwing all the rocks. It was really just one Sherpa. But this big fight did break out and it made international headlines. Um, and so that was in everybody's minds going into this expedition. Um, and so there was this kind of political tension going on as well. What, t- just talk a little bit about the challenges and the dangers of shooting. You've got kind of so many different levels of tension. You know, you've got the responsibility to your crew. You've got some a dangerous scenario. You also have to figure out, I guess, make some pretty hardcore decisions about how you handle it and being respectable under yeah. a crisis. Just talk a little, Absolutely. Just a little bit about that. I mean, in the immediate um, aftermath, we were safer at least, so I thought we were. But the, the following year, and the earthquake triggered another av- another avalanche, which came through right through where our camp was. So I, you know, I was thinking that base camp was was fine. We were fine for that year. No avalanches hit base camp, but um, you know, I did have to be really careful. Some our, our data wrangler was um, a young guy um, who was you know, really kind of, I had to say, almost traumatised. He was, you know, really scared. He'd never experienced anything like that before. Mm -hmm. Whereas the professional mountaineers, that side of the crew, they'd seen it all before. Um, And so it was a delicate balance. Then in terms of dealing with the politics at base camp and doing the right thing, we had, because I had such a long relationship with this particular Sherpa Mm -hmm. team, but also I had a translator who was Sherpa, Mm -hmm. who lives in Australia. So I had a really close relationship with him. And what I ended up doing with Nima was making him my go-to person so I wouldn't do anything approach any Sherpas or go and do any interviews or anything without checking whether or not culturally you know or politically in any way shape or form that was inappropriate so for example that meant not talking to the Sherpas at all the night that the avalanche happened they would you know they were all in shock and and grieving and and you know so we didn't do any of that but what happened pretty quickly was because I had met a lot of these Sherpas already and the leaders, a lot of the Sherpa leaders from the other expeditions. And so when I'd be out there filming, because in fact my camera crew, the non-climbing camera crews, one of them were up with on another mountain where our clients were acclimatising mm-hmm. when the thing happened. And so it ended up just being me filming because my Australian crew decided to stay just at base camp. Um, so then it, I, I had to pick up a camera, which is not something I'd done for a while. But I was recognised straight away and if somebody said, why is she filming? They'd say, oh, that's the Sherpa girl. She's making the Sherpa movie. Oh, okay. And so then they'd kind of help me and lift me up onto rocks and push people out of the way so I could get a better vantage point. So it was kind of those years of dividends paying back. Having that relationship. Having that relationship. And I'd, I'd met in Kathmandu like on previous trips, you know, doing all the due diligence and meeting all those people. They, you know, all of the main Sherpa leaders... Um, and the main kind of people at base camp all knew who I was. So that kind of paved the way to really amazing access. And it got to the point where Sherpas would come to, angry Sherpas would come to our camp and say, where's the camera girl, where's the Sherpa lady? I want to talk to the to the cameras. And they would, would do that, which is highly unusual. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the things I was most nervous about in making this film, that the Sherpas never want to say anything to upset anyone. But in this case, because this avalanche provoked such anger, mm-hmm. Because of course the foreigners wanted to keep climbing. They said, "Well, we've paid our money. Why can't we? Yeah. Why can't we keep climbing?" Not really respecting the fact that you'd, you'd then be climbing over the bodies of their fallen comrades, and and um, and not just once or twice, but thirty times. So the Sherpas, you know, really shut down the the season, really, which they'd never done. It had never happened before, um, and it was a, a real moment of empowerment. Mm. Um, do you, shall we roll the next clip, the, um, the rescue? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, sure. Yes, you're yes. going to make me in charge? Yeah, yeah. Please, please listen. Yeah, we agree with you. Okay, yeah. I understand yeah. Yeah. you're a mountain guide. Yeah. I'm a mountain guide. Yeah. We've all got friends missing and yeah. dead. We know that, okay? We can't get everything up on the first load. Kevin, do you need a Nepali guide? You should have to send fast. We want to send a doctor. Doctor, request a Nepali doctor. Doctor and one Nepali guide. I need authorization from you to tell all the mountain guides not to go. Who are these people? Uh, the, the police mountain guides. 
Yeah, I mean, I played that clip because you can see the attitude that led to the Sherpa anger. So my expedition leader, who I'd known for a very long time, was that guy at the helipad saying, no, you can't go up there. These foreign climbers have to go up there. And the Sherpas are saying, no, it's, it's our people, it's our brothers, it's our cousins. It's our, and they wanted to be up there to do things the way that they needed to happen. But they were just dismissed as kind of people that didn't know what they were doing and um, and the foreign climbers were... Au contraire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the foreign climbers were, were sent up there and so that was the beginning of, of their kind of anger. But, but as you could see in that, you know, we had kind of full access to all of that and, and really no other... There was no other camera crew there because, um, you know, they, they probably wouldn't have been allowed in there. So we kind of had this amazing access um, and I was operating this camera I'd only just learned to use the afternoon before um, but it was you know it was a you know very intense kind of time and our sound recordist um, st stuck with Renan Osterk who's one of the best climbers in the world and was just sort of literally being dragged over ice and and terrified and he was I mean he was very shaken up by the end of that day and um, but, you know, the work that he did on that day was, you know, pretty much, um, you know, it was incredible work that he did. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. I mean, the, I don't know how many people have seen the film, but it, it kind of ramped up after that, the political anger and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but the immediate, I kept it to the immediate kind of physical danger stuff for this <coughs> particular... Um, how how was it to stitch together... Or you know the story and audio with all this i yeah. mean that would have been really yeah, it's a huge amount of work yeah. yeah and getting footage and trying to get uh, you know a cohesive story amongst all I, even the other question i wanted to ask you also is when you you went there with a certain intention and then something else happened you know and so how do you as a filmmaker switch gears and try to you know, deal with a really serious and terrifying experience. I mean, mm. I'm going to ask these guys as well. Um, For me, it, it's all about story. So I, I'm someone that, you know, I write really detailed treatments as if it's a movie and I have no idea what's going to happen, but I had a fair idea having been on kind of three Everest expeditions before about how the drama would manifest and how my... In fact, what was going to happen is my main character was going to break the world record for the most number of ascents. And so the... <laughs> then the response, what it was going to be, um, you know, where he felt about that. And in fact, what ended up happening is he quit climbing completely, which is mm -hmm. a far better story. Um, and so I had to rewrite that treatment in my head. I had to figure out, you know, I knew I wasn't going to have it. In fact, we didn't know that we had a film. A lot of people think, oh, you had 
you were lucky in some ways that you had a much better film, but in fact, Universal were on the phone saying, if there's no summit, then there's no movie. <laughs> and um, so we had to repitch the film when we got home. I didn't know that, they didn't tell me that, but um, I had to rewrite all the treatments when I got back and try and prove to them that in fact we did have a, a better film. But, you know, just to, to that end, to, did I have a film, I think, was the very last thing I shot on the very last day before I left that the village um, where Perbatashi came from and I'd been tiptoeing around it because I know that he was still processing everything and but I knew that if he didn't have a pretty major response to what had happened particularly given his family had voiced so um, directly how unhappy they were about him climbing that I didn't have character transformation and I probably didn't have a very good film. <laughs> and so I knew that I needed him to respond and in some way um, to that incident about his future and in the climbing industry. And, um, and so I, I just kept asking the question in a gentle way and eventually he gave me a really strong answer and he's, he's stuck to that. He's never, he hasn't climbed again. He works as a base camp manager, but he doesn't climb doesn't anymore. Climb anymore. Yeah, I was going to ask you what um, what was, you know, the outcome of everybody, but you sort of answered my question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought so. maybe um, we could open up to a very brief Q and A. If anybody has any questions about to Jen or about the film before she has to go, but just before she gets there, I mean, one of the things that when you're embarking on something this kind of essentially dangerous is is choosing the right crew. And so we had two mountaineers, one of whom had climbed Everest before the other one who could have done it with his eyes closed, um, and then the two Sherpa cameramen. And then I had myself and I'd worked on Everest and then the rest of the crew at base camp. So we really picked people that were going to be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. Now that leads to my question was, did any of your crew leave because it sounded incredibly scary and he says the sound guy was quite traumatised and the you know, data wrangle was traumatised. <laughs> like how do you get them beyond that to stay? It was, it to was stay? the toughest for the non-mountaineers, I have to say. Yeah, so, um, no, they, they stuck it out. Hugh Miller, my cinematographer, who I'd worked with on mountains before, um, he ended up leaving early. Um, he had, a, I think, a baby that was just about to turn one. It was one of the reasons I was saying to him, Hugh, you don't want this job, you know, you're going to hate it, you're going to miss your kid. And, no, 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 I really want to do it. So he came and once we knew that the expedition was not going to go ahead, we knew we weren't going to need as many people and he said to me one day as we were filming, on, over the radio actually, we were filming all of the foreigners leaping onto helicopters and choppering back to the Hyatt um, he, he said, do you think I could get on one of those choppers? And I said, go for it. So he had 20 minutes to pack his bag and, and he left and sent us text messages from the Hyatt Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and we stayed for about another two weeks. So everybody else stayed? Everybody else stayed and they were amazing. Yeah. You're really amazing. Anybody else? Okay. Were you scared? <laughs> When I, I I'd been on Everest, a, as I said a couple of times, always on the Tibet side, so I, I'd never had to go through that ice fall. And I'd said to my husband, no, 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 I'm not going to climb the mountain. I have two kids now. And he said, um, but what about the ice fall? Oh, no, 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 I'll just stay at base camp. And then a couple of my climbing friends said, you're really going to need to go to camp too to get any kind of drama because that's where it becomes advanced base camp. I said, okay, I'll probably do that. When I got to base camp, I looked at those cliffs that you see in that last cliff, that cliff rather, and I actually said out loud to someone, what's stopping those things falling down? Mm -hmm. And I actually had a really funny feeling and I thought, I don't think, as a parent, I don't think I can do that. And um, luckily I never had to test that theory, so, mm. because nobody climbed through that um, ice fall anymore, but, and um, yeah, mm. so I was a bit scared. Right. Uh, what was the deal you had with the financiers um, originally? You, you mentioned that uh, they said no summit, no, no film. What was the contract that you agreed to before you went? Um, it, I mean, it didn't actually say no summit, no film. But, no, um, no. Because a, an expedition had never been cancelled before, ever. So in the history of climbing Everest, so nobody thought that that was even a possibility. 
But at one point, Universal were trying to get us to guarantee that the weather forecast would be good. And I said, <laughs> and I remember saying to them, so what? Classic. So I'm not God. How, what are you? What? So they, it was clear that they were nervous. That Did you have a lot of written information from them, like a, a contract about exactly what you were going to deliver to them? My wonderful producer, Bridget Iken, has said at one of these Q&As once before, in documentary, even though it seems bloody obvious, always write, this treatment is speculative at the bottom of the treatment because it, it did seem that Universal took the treatment very literally, which is why I then had to completely rewrite. And these are sort of 27, 30-page treatments that, you know, like a three-act structure that outline exactly what, what's happening and when. And so I redid that when I got back um, based on what had actually happened and then we cut them what we call the beauty reel and then an example scene and then the new treatment and they said okay they're happy with that it's like they needed the concrete thing and so once they had that concrete thing and could see that there was drama in this new story they they stayed on board How could they not? and screen yeah. australia were there and they were very supportive so yeah <clears throat> okay thank you um jen thank you so much i'm so sorry i have to go <laughs> Years a little bit, um, and you know, going from kind of the big feature documentary and the dangers around that, we are um, going to talk to James. Um, so James Rickardson is an Australian film director who, in June 2017, was arrested while flying a drone at Cambodia National Rescue Party rally in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and charged with espionage, a charge he denies. He was sentenced to six years of espionage that was widely criticized by human rights activists and politicians. James was recently granted clemency from the Cambodian king. His documentaries include Reflections, Rosalind uh, Blagitsa, thank you. Everybody Needs a Friend, Born in Soweto, Sleeping with Cambodia, Backpacking Australia, and Viva. Welcome home, James. Thank you. Um, I just wanted you to paint a little bit of a picture of, um, you know, Cambodia and the, the um, relationship that you have with the place, because I know that you lived there for a really long time, and then set the scene for the clip that we're going to show, which ultimately, a few years later, led to your arrest. Okay, so in 1995, 96, I went to Cambodia to make a documentary about child prostitution and street kids and non-government organisations. Um, I hadn't been to Cambodia before. I'd read an article in a newspaper that had got me interested in, in being there. I bought a, a camera, a digital camera at the airport, taught myself how to use it and made a documentary. It wasn't quite the documentary that I'd intended to make and it was one that was uh, bought by the ABC. Um, Mike Rubo wound up being the commissioning editor at the ABC and he is the one who is responsible for the title of the film, Sleeping with Cambodia. Um, in, the, in the course of doing that, making the film, I became very close to a young girl by the name of Shanti who was eight or nine years old. She and her mother lived on the street opposite the hotel that I was staying in and they wound up featuring in the documentary that I made. And <clears throat> I found myself in a position that I'm sure a lot of documentary filmmakers find themselves in, where having done a day of filming with very poor people living on the street or people working in a rubbish dump or girls working in a brothel, I found myself going back to my hotel, um, having a shower, going out and having a nice meal, a glass of wine, you know, and I, I felt very uncomfortable about filming with very poor people during the day and then having a comfortable evening. Um, so I decided that I was going to help Shanti and her mother. I put Shanti into school. This is a very long story, cut short. I put Shanti into school. I got a job for her mother and I rented them a small apartment. Six or so months later, Shanti had left the school. Um, the mother had left her job. They'd left the apartment and were living back down on the street again with a community of other very poor families. So that began a relationship between myself and Shanti, which ex uh, continues to this day. Shanti is now 32 years old and has nine children, um, uh, all of whom, or the, all of whom who can speak, uh, who call me Papa. So I've actually got nine foster grandchildren, I guess you could call them, in Cambodia. Um, I'm very close to the family. I love them very much. 
And um, so that's what's kept me going back to Cambodia. Uh, on the one hand, documenting Shanti's life in a, in a documentary called Shanti's World, looking at, the, looking at Cambodia, the transformation of Cambodia through the eyes of a, of a young street kid growing into being a mother to nine children. And along the way, got very caught up in a whole range of other stories and it was impossible to avoid getting caught up in things that were happening politically in Cambodia. So the clip that we're about to see goes back to 2014. It was after the election, an election that the um, Cambodian National Rescue Party, the opposition party, may have won. Uh, they certainly came very close to winning it. And there was a lot of political turmoil after the election. And uh, this was a particular peaceful demonstration. There were about 50 or so um, activists who were peacefully demonstrating and what we're about to see is um, the police response to that. What's interesting from, from the perspective of dangerous documentaries is that I was there. I wasn't expecting this to happen at all. I had a very big camera. Um, I realised that something of a dramatic nature was going to happen and you'll, you'll see in the... I, I found myself in a particular shot where or standing in front of, a, I suppose, about 50 or so uh, police heavily armed with plexiglass shields and with electric cattle prods that they were going to use to disperse the demonstrators. And it was one of those moments, I'm sure, that Mark has been in, in this kind of situation, probably you also, where on the one hand you think, this is an amazing shot, I have to shoot this. <laughs> on the other hand you think, um, this is also dangerous, what I'm doing is dangerous and how long will I keep the shot for? As it happened, somebody else was filming from behind me and there's one shot of me in the clip you're about to see wearing a white hat and you would get an idea of the situation that I was in, so. Okay.
Actually, my recollection is faulty. There's more than 50 people, but it wasn't. There were more police than there were demonstrators. So, do you want to tell us what happened between sort of this clip and I? I think what we're all really okay. wanting to know is okay. you Why painting a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. painting a picture well, the day that you were arrested. Okay. Well, so. Um, I covered a lot of the, um, the chaos that ensued after that particular election. I shot two or three things like this. Uh, the police were not very happy with me being there filming that stuff, but they didn't do anything to stop me. And the, and, and the reason why they didn't is <clears throat> complicated, but I'm tall and my attitude towards the police then was do not fuck with me. O often police who are much shorter than I, I am would come up to me and wave me away from the camera and I'd just completely ignore them. I'd just hold the camera on them. And, and I learnt very quickly that they'd tend to kind of leave me alone. Now, <laughs> cutting a long story short, um, I'd been doing this for years and I knew that the police had taken photographs of me, that they'd filmed me, that they had a dossier on me. And various different people said to me, James, you have to be careful. You've made a lot of enemies in Cambodia. You're going to get into trouble. And I got cocky. And uh, I think that like kind of a prize fighter that's won... 27 bouts in a row, I thought I was going to win number 28. So um, on the 2nd of June, I flew a drone over a political rally. I wasn't overly concerned. I was a little bit nervous about doing it. But th in fact, there were um, quite a few policemen at the rally. And I figured that if they were concerned about me using the drone, uh, that someone would stop me. And they didn't stop me. So I kept filming. The following day, I got arrested quite brutally. I won't go into the details of that. But um, in fact, there was no law that forbade me from flying a drone. The law wasn't promulgated until two months after um, my arrest, um, and probably as a result of my arrest, actually. But the reasons, ultimately the reason for them um, arresting me was had nothing to do with the drone. I was never charged with flying the drone. It had to do with the fact that I was a a thorn in the Cambodian government's side. I was a thorn in the side of various different non-government organisations in Cambodia that I'd been very critical of. To this day, I don't know exactly who it was that instigated my arrest, but I do know that when they realised that I also had a professional relationship with Sam Rainsy, who was the leader of the opposition, they realised, the Cambodian authorities realised, that they had a captive journalist that they could present to the... Um, Cambodian public as a spy who was conspiring with CNRP and the CIA, the United States, to foment a colour revolution or a coup in Cambodia. So I became a pawn in a political game, basically. Uh, my question is, when <coughs> did you figure out that it was actually really serious? Is there a particular moment that once you were arrested, did you just kind of still well, have that cocky? <clears throat> well, after I was arrested, um, let's see. Okay, so I was, I was arrested and it took them six days of interrogations uh, before I was told that I was going to be charged with um, being a spy, with espionage. I said to the investigating judge who informed me of this, I said, you've got to be fucking kidding. Uh, and I laughed, I didn't take it particularly seriously. <laughs> Um, even during the first, I suppose, two or three weeks that I was in jail, um, and as you're probably aware, I was in a very crowded cell, um, about one square metre per prisoner in each of the cells that I was in, um, I figured that because there was no evidence that I was a spy, obviously no evidence, I figured that someone from the Department of Foreign Affairs would get on to somebody from the, in the Cambodian Department of Foreign Affairs and sort it out. Uh, this proved not to be the case, and there was no evidence at all for the first year or so that I was in jail that the, um, the Australian government was doing anything at all to help me. In fact, I got various letters from the ambassador, Australia's ambassador in Cambodia, basically saying, we can't intervene, this is a matter for you and your legal team to take up with um, the Cambodian judiciary and the government. And even when, at one point in about, I suppose about September 2017, my name and my face began to appear in propaganda on government-run television, um, implicating me in this planned coup. There were burning cars, dead children, barbed wire, chaos and mayhem 
and there was my face and name in amongst it all, which is against wow. Article 83 of the Cambodian um, Code of Criminal Procedure. So everything, everything that happened was illegal, and everything that happened to me was clearly illegal, and the Australian government knew that it was illegal. And when I wrote to the government, basically saying, how can you allow the Cambodian government to be using me as a, as a tool in this way in propaganda programming, I got a letter back from Angela Corcoran, the Australian ambassador, saying this is a matter for you to take up with your legal team. So I got zero support from Australia until um, I decided with members of my family to make as big a fuss as I possibly could in the media. Um, and so a whole campaign was uh, implemented, which resulted in 108,000 people signing the change.org uh, petition. Uh, various newspaper articles, letters written to members of parliament and so on. And I think we've seen the same thing happen happened in just in the last few days with the footballer who's been released, with the young woman from Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago that um, very cleverly um, uh, conducted her own kind of media campaign. I think without, without getting the media behind your cause, whatever that cause might be, um, you're fucked, basically, because the Australian government will not help you. So why, why is that, and how did you, you know, summon up getting help while you were well, there? Well, it's a it's a matter of policy, and in fact, it, uh, in jail, I met a lot of other people from different countries, and and basically, there are no countries at all, except with the possible exception of the Americans, that actually um, defend their own citizens. Um, they're left to their own devices, even when, even when it's clear that, that, that their citizens have been. Um, falsely arrested and there's no evidence that they've committed a crime. And that was the case with this footballer, as, as I understand it. But it was public opinion and the media that got him out of jail. Not, I, I, I think if it hadn't been for that, that the uh, Australian government, the Thai government and the Bahrain government wouldn't have... They would have just let, the, let, let him be extradited mm -hmm. back to Bahrain, I suspect. And how did you cope and communicate while you were... I know that you were I, in a very small area. You're very I was tall. in a very small area. Um, uh, because this has been recorded, I probably need to be a little bit discreet about the way in which I was able to communicate inside the jail to outside the jail, but I was able to communicate. Um, yeah, okay. leave it at that, yeah. Okay. Um, and finally, what? Um, how does one go about getting a pardon from a king? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, there's no short answer to that particular question. My case, I actually felt very early on in my incarceration like a character in a Jean le Carré novel. And uh, there are many levels and layers to my story and it may come as no surprise to discover that in fact I didn't get a pardon from the king. There is no pardon from the king. I was not deported. I have not been banned from going back to Cambodia. They don't want me to come back to Cambodia for obvious reasons. And various people don't want me to come back to Cambodia. I've got a whole family there that I need to take care of and other families that I'm helping, so I want to go back to Cambodia. So I'm in this uh, awkward position at the moment. And again, this comes back to not so much the danger of making documentaries, but the danger, I suppose, of being a documentary filmmaker who gets involved in, in um, the lives of the people that he's filming, is that I've got to weigh up my own safety um, against my commitment to helping various different people in Cambodia. Of course, my family, my friends, the people that love me think I'm crazy to even think about going back to Cambodia. But I can't just give up 23 years, 22, 23 years of relationships with various Cambodian families that I know. So it's a, it's a tricky mm -hmm. dilemma that I'm confronted by. I'm glad that you're safe and that you're home. And, um, I'm glad that I'm safe and at home too. <laughs> um, what we might do is we'll open the Q&A after we sure. hear from Olivia and Mark. So if you can just hang tight, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, so going from access and empathy and um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of tag team you two. Um, Olivia, um, uh, Olivia is a, a two-time Walkley award-winning documentary filmmaker and video journalist. She has a strong engagement with stories of social justice and usually works alone, shooting and directing her own films. 
Uh, Olivia spent seven years making stories for Dateline, SBS's flagship international current affairs program covering stories from all over the world. She's also made documentaries for ABC Arts, Compass, and worked on various independent documentaries. And Olivia has recently made a one-hour radio documentary about Nauru. Um, tonight we're going to have a look at a, an extraordinary short um, that you made on Manus Island. Um, do you want to? Um, do you want me to run it, or do you want to set it up, Olivia? Um, I'll set it up quickly. Uh, firstly, I need to update my LinkedIn bio. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's guilty. Um, it's a bit dry. Um, I, I went to Manus a year and a bit ago when it was in a period where there was a standoff, where the Australian government had clo officially closed down the detention centre for the men there. And they'd taken away all resources, all food, all water, all medication, everything. They were trying to force the men to move into new accommodation. Um, and the men sort of saw it as their final stand to demand their freedom. And they felt that if they were moved, as happened, it would just continue. And that this was an opportunity for them to say, no, this isn't right. We're being held um, in a very unjust way and we're going to stay. But it was... It was an extraordinary time for all sorts of reasons because it's, it's the first time they had autonomy in four and a bit years and quite a, I think many of you may have heard Beirut Bushani talk about it, but quite a beautiful thing came out of that, which I don't have time to go into tonight, out of them becoming their own, you know, the rulers of their own little domain and, and everything. But it was an opportunity. I'd been, for Dateline, I did a story, I think, around 2005 uh, when there was one man left in Manus Island Detention Centre. Um, the Australian government were making an example of him. He'd been there for over a year on his own. He was going mad. He was in his early 20s. Um, and I now sort of somewhat ironically called it the last man on Manus Island. And after he was released um, and came to Australia and got permanent residency, he, the detention centre was closed down. So I'd always had a connection to the place and I suppose um, I'd seen what happened to one man from being imprisoned there. They basically destroyed him and then to see hundreds of men go through the same thing was pretty horrible. So I got a call. I was working um, with Sally at ABC Arts doing a theatre documentary on a theatre piece. Um, and I got a call from two Christian leaders who I'd worked with before when I did worked on Compass, and they asked me if I would come with them in 24 hours to Manus to film a trip they were planning to go there to raise awareness and sort of tap into the, the Christian heartland of Australia and try and make them care about um, the men there. And I, I felt like this was an opportunity. I, the media hadn't been interested in covering stories from there and access had been really hard, and suddenly it was an opportunity to do something. So... I um, took a few days leave from my arts job <laughs> to go and volunteer and um, went up there. And it wasn't hard to get in, um, but we had to be smuggled in and there was this whole, I won't go into all of it, but there was this sort of elaborate cover that had to be um, done and we had to go in at night time, sort of lying in the bottom of a little fishing boat and it was very sort of um, secret squirrel with, you know, as he is on the beach, you know, putting his flash on 10 times it's like do it again do seven <laughs> you know <laughs> anyway it was you know uh, but it was exciting to go in there and it was good but it was sort of one of those things where I you know I wasn't being paid I didn't necessarily have a film to make out of it but I was gathering the footage and I sort of felt like I had to do it but you you know like Jen said I had kids by that stage and for years I worked at Dateline and done stuff that was probably very dangerous in an overt way but you know you're doing that and that's fine when you're telling a story but I had to think about uh, I tried to get three other people actually to do it um, and none of them could do it. <laughs> and then I, you know, my partner said, you have to do it, do it. So I did and I don't regret doing it. But um, yeah, anyway, look at the thing and then I'll say some things. Okay. We have been recognised as a refugee under international law and we deserve to get freedom. I'm 
among us, if you look at us, among us, we have a doctors, we have engineers, we have a uh, teachers. I got a diploma in mathematics and physics back uh -huh. home. Yeah. So, but I forgot everything. All I know, two plus two is five now. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifies me, you know? Mm. I feel petrified, but when I get out of here when I go to society because I've been institutionalized for over four years. Mm -hmm. I've been acclimatized. Yeah. So but I still I believe there's a lot waiting for me out there. I hope it just happens as soon as possible. Mm. We lost our beloved brothers mm. because of this cruel policy. He hung himself because he was under pressure. They sent him in East Lorengo and he was under pressure. No one helped me, help him, and they don't care about him. And he hung himself. Government uh, of PNG and Australia, they, they really don't care about no. us. So. No. In Australia, they're saying we are spending $9 billion in here. Do you think that they spend $9 billion on us? Thirty-five guys used to live inside this room. And this is a tent, as you know, during the day, it's really hot and humid. And without electricity, you cannot even stay 10 seconds inside the room. They tried to show our bad picture to the world. They talk, okay, these are from third world. They don't know anything. So we are watching the same Hollywood movies that you watch, you know? We are watching, listening to the same music that you are listening yeah. to, you know? I was you like working in US military base back in Afghanistan. Yeah. I was a policeman in uh, Iraq. I came here 24, but wow. now I'm 29. Mm. I had five birthdays mm. here in this hill. But I was 20. You're 20. 20 when I was already, and I'm 24 and a half. Wow. Yeah. 23 when I came 23. here. When I came here, I was like semi-pro soccer player back home. I got weaker, I got older, my mind is just... Open in a, an Afghan cafe because I yeah. am a cook, not a chef. Oh. <laughs> I'm a cook, so... I'm 28. I'm 29, mm. almost 30. Mm. When I came here, I'm 24. I, I, I have one children in Afghanistan, yes, with my family. And his name is Muzaffar. And also my family, I have three children. Oh, wow. five years I didn't see my children you know. so that's it's that's not um, it's a filmmaker an artist actually I gave him my footage and he put together a film um, out of that so it's not a film that I ended up actually making so it was cut we, the plan was that we would go in there we would get this footage and it was gonna you know we'd bring it back and it would be used but we the idea was and we had a fixer who was quite incredible he was a local guy who created this whole cover when we arrived to the extent that he even took us around to local radio stations and did interviews on we were there for some christian conference and you know went around and it was just ridiculously good the kind of groundwork he laid so there's something in in that in trusting locals like he knew what needed to be done um so we just went along with it didn't stay in hotels we slept on the floor in his village and all of that um, but, you know, we arrived there, I did write some things down, so maybe I should look. Um, you know, we arrived there at night uh, when it was dark, sort of eight-ish, nine o'clock. And the idea was we'd shoot some stuff, we'd stay until midnight and then we'd go. And we got a little bit carried away because we arrived and it was pretty intense because we just sort of walked, like we had to sort of sneak in there. But once we were in there, the PNG Navy, the previous Easter, had fired upon the detention centre when they got drunk and um, they were no longer allowed to go in there and the Australians had abandoned it. So it was this strange safe space that we were in, even though I had my camera light on and we were filming, to a certain extent we sort of felt safe when we were in there, probably wrongly so. But we kept shooting and just said to Beirut and Aziz, what do you want us to do? And they just said, we just want new voices, new people. So man after man just stepped in front of the camera and just started talking and it sort of felt like we we owed it to them just to you know, record what they wanted to say. So about three in the morning, I get a text from the fixer who's somewhere saying, um, do you think you'll be ready soon? And oh, and maybe a bit earlier. And I said, can we stay a bit longer? And we did. And, and we left it too late. And that was a real mistake because we, we had a really sort of watertight plan, which was, you know, get in there and get out by midnight. And we should have got out. And 
what we should have done is gone, met face to face and discussed the next stage, but we just got carried away with what we were doing, which is, um, was a bit of a problem. So about 4 a.m. maybe we went down to the beach and a whole lot of the men followed us down. We were probably too noisy saying goodbye and whatever. Um, we'd let our guard down and then a Navy guy with a torch started coming towards us and everyone, it was a funny moment actually, we're standing on this tiny bit of beach and one priest jumps in the boat I didn't know he was in the boat, but and the boat's just there. But then all the refugees sort of ducked and pushed back into the bushes. So we just, this other religious guy, uh, religious guy, pastor, Jared and I, um, went into the bush and just started following. They just started running, so we just started running and went back to the detention centre. And when we got there and realised that we'd missed the boat, um, we sort of sat and talked about what to do and we called our fixer and he said... Uh, it's too light, you won't get out. you got to wait until the next night. And this is where I started going, shit. You know, I kind of calculated. I had a big chat to my partner before I left and said, all right, the worst that's going to happen is I'm going to get arrested and deported. You know, I was pretty confident that, that, that I wasn't going to die, I wasn't going to face any huge physical danger in this situation. Um, you know, I had friends, Bronwyn had been arrested in PNG and she'd eventually, it'd like it to be not a very nice thing to happen, but... You know, it was sort of worth it. It was calculated. I didn't... I was angry at myself at this point that I was then stuck there for 24 hours because it was going to be daylight. We hadn't slept. The men... There was no food and I eat a lot. Um, they were on living on smuggled food. They fed us um, one meal a day. But uh, anyway, so we... they And I wanted to keep filming, but they hid us because they could have... The, the danger then switched into being that they are in danger. Our presence would put them in danger in daylight. If the PNG military or immigration saw us there, they might use it as an excuse to storm the place and relocate the men, which is what everyone wanted to happen, all the um, powers that be. So we kind of hid in very hot, airless shipping containers for the day until the next night mm. and um, had to swim out to the boat under darkness <laughs> in our underpants. <laughs> <laughs> and my, finding out that there was crime. Yeah, with my camera in it. It was, it was, it was a lot. Yeah, I'm not going to go there. But camera, you know, put in this container. Our fixer came up with it. I think he got a bit excited and watched too many movies and came up with a great plan. And I was furious because it wasn't in my plan. And I liked to be in control. And I suppose that as soon as the plan disintegrated, it was like I... I wanted to be on top of everything I wanted to know. I, I was the one who was making the decisions because I've done things before where I've been in control and it worked. <laughs> anyway, we um, swam out and we got the footage out, we copied it, you know. Not a lot happened with it for all sorts of reasons, but, you it's know. It's nice to see that, you know, what you did capture was a really empathetic and humanised the men that is so devoid in any kind of... Media. Oh, I think it's the only report when anyone got actually got inside. Ben Doherty it? got in there and did a Und newspaper thing. Undercover or yeah, at night time. There were a couple, yeah. and it was funny when I was leaving. I'm so naive, like you know, I'm old enough not to be. But I was leaving, and I was just like, oh, guys, so many journalists are going to come now because you can come. You know, like you sort of spent four or five years going, hey, isn't mm -hmm. it true? Like, mm -hmm. if only we could get there mm -hmm. and let people meet these people and tell their stories. Australians would know, you know, how cruel this is or how, how ordinary they are, how like everyone we know they are. You know, like the guy says, I love that thing when he says, we watch the same movies yeah, as you yeah, do. Yeah, you know, yeah. like human. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but that's our job is to... No one followed that. Yeah. No one, and, and no one went. Or actually, within a week, they were then forcibly re relocated. But um, people didn't. And it was relatively easy to get there, you know. Like it wasn't hard. I went, you know, I was a... Um, I went under, you know, undercover. I was a church photographer, <laughs> or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. nearly hiding under a cassock. But you know, um, <laughs> but you could you could do it. You could take a snorkel and goggles and say, mm. "I'm going," and then organise something and get in there. But people mm. just didn't do it. And I think well, a lot of that is broadcasters here weren't interested, so the motivation wasn't there. But you know, uh, well, there's a lot of stories like that really in Australia. You know, yeah. we use the excuse that we can't get in. It was the excuse that was used in East Timor for the media mm. throughout the 90s. Absolutely mm. not, not a single Australian would go, with a couple of rare exceptions, and most, most of them weren't 
for the full-time employed journalists, they would use this excuse, oh, you can't get in, and then they'd use the excuse, well, you can't trust the information because we can't get in, so therefore we ignore the story. <laughs> and then, of course, East Timor turned and everyone, as soon as CNN was there, people were falling over themselves to get in. Mm -hmm. Manus was absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, Brom Bromwen broke into Nauru with a mm -hmm. Islamic head gear, didn't she? And cut, cut, cut the fence Went open. Into Went into the back <laughs> She was, I think, the only one that got in. People use it as the excuse to this day to ignore West Papua, yeah, where, where you know, tribal people are being shot from helicopters this month, this month, and no one sees it as a story. Mm -hmm. or, or if they do see it as a story, oh, we can't get in. Mm -hmm. right? We can't get a visa or, uh, well, here's some information. Well, we can't trust the information. I mean, it's this horrible... Or the audience doesn't want to see it. Or the audience doesn't want to see it. It's this horrible cycle. Uh, um, in Australia, That's and uh, and I think the media in particular has become uh, much more conservative in this. Uh, you know, if you're working on a program now, I mean, I, I, my jaw hits the floor. It's only happened to me in the last four years. Or something. Have you got a visa? No, I don't have a visa. I'm not going to, you know, it's impossible to get a visa. Well, we can't do the story, right? You have to write to this filthy government yeah. and ask them mm -hmm. for a journalist visa. Well, of course, you're not going to get one, mm -hmm. or if you do, you're not going to get a good story. So... Anyway, that was a little segue, but <laughs> when, when you said <laughs> that, yeah. we mm. might go to um, mark your story on Madagascar and uh, talking about kind of early ad ad adapters with one of um, Mark's one of the first journalists to do solo stories with the little one chip digital cameras all those years back. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who don't know, Mark's been a journalist for over 18 years, has won five Walkley Awards um, and um, countless other awards. And um, I didn't know this, but you're a qualified lawyer turned documentary maker turned journalist. Why? Turned Mark? lawyer again. I'm now, <laughs> I, 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 I'm now a criminal lawyer. If you have any black sheep in the family... Or, uh, <laughs> journalism doesn't pay. But journal, gen, yeah, journalism oh, does not pay. I mean, yes. Yeah, we so, should do a whole other session on how yeah. things have changed. Um, um, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. Well, I'll so, show Madagascar. So, um, do you want to set up the Madagascar? I'll set up Madagascar. So, and the reason I, I chose it... I, I worked on Foreign Correspondent and Four Corners, Dateline, and... and uh, I guess they're all on topic to this being danger programs. And they were ridiculously dangerous, really, some of them, <laughs> when I think back. Uh, not just for me, but for really everybody that was working on them. They were a bit ridiculous. But uh, I got through, and I did it for a hell of a long time, longer than most people do it, really tw 20 years. And I've got uh, two arms and two legs, and I'm alive. And uh, there were times when I didn't expect to be alive. Uh, I was speaking to... Olivia earlier today and we both mentioned that we used to either write a will or find our will before we went on a story. You know, you'd sort of sort your desk out and make sure the will was here and, you know, I mean, it's, that's sort of insane, right? I, mm -hmm. When I look back, I, I understand it's insane, but uh, uh, nevertheless, it was done. So uh, I, I wanted to pick a couple of clips uh, tonight. They're not the most uh, uh, gruesome of clips or not necessarily the most dangerous where, you know, bloodshed and screaming and stuff, but they're dangerous enough. But I chose this first one because it, it, it indicates to me the sort of decisions I made as to how to stay alive, to do dangerous things and stay alive. And, and the basis of that was the first work I started to get was in for foreign correspondent in Afghanistan in the mid-90s and Taliban had just started. The general civil war was going on. The media had lost interest uh, since the Russians had left. There was a vacuum. No journalists were there. So it wasn't very hard to find um, quite experienced fixers and drivers when you went there. I was the only sort of you know white guy in Kabul, for instance, when I got there. I met this old uh, driver who had a green Persia, and he was the most famous fixer in, in um, Kabul. And he'd had three dead journalists. Um, and he was a pretty interesting guy for me to talk to about how these journalists died. And he would give me these little heads up. And one of the heads up was don't try and film um, rocket fire. He had two journalists, one of them I knew or knew of, both killed this by this way. When you're, when you're covering war, your editor always wants that aimless shot of, uh, uh, you know, the, the mortar goes into the tube and, right. and, the, 
Like three seconds, and it sets up the story, you're at war, right? And I felt the compulsion to do it. I was covering a war. I didn't have the, 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 the mortar shot and, or the, you know... Anyway, this guy, great guy, I, on a quiet day, as all journalists do, on a quiet day, you go get some pickups, you know, and the pickup is the, the war. He said, don't do it. And he said, I've had two journalists die this way, right? And two of them, he said <laughs> this to me. Uh, I've got to think what he said, actually. Oh, yeah. So when you go up, you want, you want to get the, your guys firing over the valley into the, into the trenches of, you know, the Taliban. And the trouble is, they fire back. <laughs> and, and, and often in war, war is not so active. The days and days and days, nothing happens. Everyone just sort of sits and watches and waits for an opportunity. And so as a journalist, you start going up saying, fire, fire something down there. They fire back really easily, really quickly. And, and, and you're standing right next to where the thing came from. So he had two dead journalists. So I took that as a warning. And I actually stuck to it. If anyone here does have aspirations uh, to be a, a war journalist, ditch it. it. It doesn't exist. It's a fruitless... I mean, it really doesn't exist. There's almost nobody that does it. There's people opportuni opportunistically uh, film wars. People with regular kind of journalist gigs or camera gigs will go to do a war. Uh, it's not a career, and it's certainly not well paid. You get nothing uh, for your three-second uh, shot. And more importantly, it distracts you from the story. So anyway, that's my long introduction to Madagascar, which I think uh, my view is this: there's enough danger around in the in a war type situation. Uh, it'll come flying in your face. Be ready to film it. Don't go looking for that extra bang bang. That will kill you. I've known four or five people killed. I've lived, <coughs> excuse me. I've lived through it somehow. I've lived, and I feel blessed. But I think somehow that old uh, Afghan guy kind of gave me the template. Film trouble, don't go looking for trouble. This one is uh, Madagascar, it's called Die of a Coup. Um, uh, it's, I, 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 on this clip I have the beginning of the story and the end of the story. The beginning is just to set it up uh, why I went there. There'd been a killing of 40 people in front of the presidential uh, palace, a uh, massacre. Uh, uh, which the government was denying. There was no footage of it, strangely, because there were so many people there, and they were saying activists were making it up. I went to get that story. That's the context for the first minute of this you'll see. And then a coup started to uh, bubble and erupt. So you'll see, uh, when I say there's no blood and guts, uh, there's 40 people killed at the end of the, killed at the beginning of this uh, clip and, there's, and I'm nearly killed at the end, but apart from that, there's no blood and guts. Uh, but it's, and I'll talk about it after, it's a good example for me of the type of dangers you face without, uh, you know, necessarily going to a war. Uh, so we'll play it. The red line is uh, just... Andri Rallyjohn is a senior advisor to the elected president. He was inside the palace gates, looking out as the crowd approached and the presidential guard opened fire. So they were running towards the palace. Yeah. So For Andri Rallyjohn, the blood is not on the hands of his president, but on those of the opposition for urging the crowd into such an assault. With the video, I'm going to show you. We can, we can see for ourselves, huh? Exactly. Yes. Of all the footage from that day, none clearly shows the moment of the shooting until Andre reveals this clip. It's never been broadcast. See, there is a movement. The militaries are starting to step back. He presents it to show that the crowd weren't just chanting slogans, but were surging towards the gate, scattering police and army before them. He's correct, it does show that, but it also shows a response that is staggering in its ferocity. He doesn't know it yet, but Andre Ralejon is not just watching bodies fall, he's watching the fall of his government.
Until now, the army have maintained they would not actively attack the president, holding to a technical stance that their actions were neither mutinous nor a coup. Those semantics are dropped today. The army is ready to go to the palace and um, take the, the president out. They're ready to go. They're ready to go because they couldn't stand up anymore. They couldn't bear waiting for, for a long time. Within minutes of this announcement, city streets start to be blocked off. And as I make my way towards the palace downtown, soldiers can be seen flitting in the shadows. That's the, uh, the president's office, is at the end of the street um, behind me, coincidentally. It's also where my hotel is. Uh, I've just come from the press conference where the army uh, officially announced they are now turning on the, uh, on the president. They haven't said that to, uh, to date. Uh, true to their word, it's about 15 minutes later, um, and the uh, soldiers are taking up position uh, here. It was down this street just the month before that Rajawalna's supporters ran to their death trying to storm the palace gates. Now Rajawalna has tanks at his disposal. It's unclear how the palace guard will respond this time. There's a lot of firing. I don't know if it's return fire or they're just firing into the building at the moment. This is the exact spot where uh, 30 people were gunned down here about a month ago. And it looks like uh, a vengeance is, uh, is being served today. Within 15 minutes, the palace has fallen. This is the uh, office I was in uh, just over a week ago, uh, watching the, uh, the video or the government's account of what happened on uh, February 7. Things have changed. Like presidents before him, the end of Ravalamana's reign is marked with soldiers' boots in the hallways and his portrait off the wall. A bit of brickwork and some scary blessings. And the palace is fit for its new king. With a bit of pomp, but not much ceremony, Rajawelna and his ministry swear themselves in. A few months ago, most of the world viewed Rajawelna as the successful leader of a movement for democratic change. With troops at his side and declaring that elections may not be held for another two years, that tag sits a little uneasily on his shoulders today. Uh, yeah, so he stayed in unelected. He stayed in there for three or four years. Uh, he was a he was a weird little guy. You can see the way, that look. He was actually giving me that look at the end. The most dangerous. Oh, well, okay, I'll, I'll tell this story first. The the most dangerous thing in that that was a really dangerous story, like insanely dangerous story. Not necessarily that bit. That guy got in his head that I was a South African mercenary, and he went on he went on news. So when I, when I would film him, if you ever see the film, it's a great film, if you have any friends that are planning a coup, it's a great film to see, because it's a, it really, it's an absolute blueprint for how to run a coup. Uh, he's really suspicious of me. Like some of the others, some of the army guys weren't, I was getting on okay, and he just had it, I could see it, this sort of fear and you know, suspicion. He went on TV and said that there were South African mercenaries coming, a team of South African mercenaries coming to save the president. 
And he said, one of them's posing as a journalist. Oh, my God. Um, and it went crazy. It was really, really crazy. And the guy that's with me, that lovely Gilo, who's my sort of offsider, you know, gives the... Uh, what's that Shakespearean term? You know, the, the voice, you know, off the side, you know, t tells you the narrative, yeah. yeah. He became that for me, but uh, and they turned on him in big time, big time. We had mobs chasing us, and you know, and they killed another guy who they thought was a mercenary. It was really horrific. Um, but that aside, uh, the reason I show this is that was pretty terrifying when when we hit, quite literally, just hit the ground. I didn't expect it to happen that quickly, and it only dawns on me when I'm on the concrete, uh, flat out on the concrete, that that is exactly where all the other bodies were yeah. uh, uh, previously. Uh, and you, uh, that's why I say it. Uh, I'm actually there going, oh, shit, this is where all the other people were. <laughs> all the other people are killed. What am I doing uh, uh, here? However, uh, it's not so brave, right? I'm lying flat out. I'm not trying to get that useless shot might give you a second of pleasure if you actually saw you know the gunfire coming back out of the palace um, but uh, I reckon I made a pretty smart call you can still tell a story uh, if you stick to the story and take reasonable risks I mean they're not a fairly risky thing to do but not insane the insane thing to do and if you're a freelance cameraman that's the pressure is to stick your head up above that flower pot and and start start filming so uh, that's m my lesson from that sort of thing you can tell a story don't get obsessed with that magic moment if you've got other storytelling skills uh, uh, which is more much more important than, than 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 the shot and even from a commercial point of view you know just selling your, your work uh, you get more money selling a story whether it's a long story or a new story if in fact it is a story if it's something that's worth telling rather than the the shot the shot you get, you get nothing for. You don't get any more money because you've got this amazing shot. It's the same money, you know. How do you get access, Mark? I mean, you're I just wink, 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 sort of turn up. <laughs> uh, but that's why people think you're a mercenary, you know. <laughs> I turned up. That was it. Was actually a really funny film because uh, uh, Gillo and I got on really well. Like he was just great, and we became this little team <coughs> under siege. But we just turned up at every key moment of that as they were plotting that coup. And it freaked them out. It sort of freaked us out, right? We were yeah. like, oh, God, they'll think we have inside information. We'll just turn up at different places where something's been planned. And, you know, but it was kind of a knuckle. Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, you they would were. think they would be like, get out of here. You know, what do you well, think? they get out of here. They do. But, like, they say, get out. We'd get out and we'd be on the street and then we'd hear them. You know these arguments inside the hall as they're yelling. We've got to stop this. We've got to arm. We've got to get the police on board and blah blah blah. And everyone cheers. So you're getting the audio, and then and some of them like you, and so you follow one of them, and then he's dragged off to the you know parliament, and you're with him, and it was, it was pretty amazing actually. Um, but so you know it's danger man, but sort of smart danger man. I think there's a way to uh, do it. And so even though I did a lot of wars, I resisted, certainly resisted the term uh, war journalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I resisted those pointless shots. You, you'll get them, but you won't get them for very long. You'll do it, go mad after four, mad and broke after three or four years. Um, yeah. Yeah. Rather right. mad over 20 years. Mad over 20 years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. We might go just bounce back to Olivia. Um, talking about going undercover mm. um, and access. Do you want to set up um, the next clip, which yeah. is um, Indo? I suppose it's sort of similar to Mark's thing about talking about the most dangerous situations and not um, always the most apparently dangerous. But this is um, it was a long time ago, probably about 14 years ago, but... Uh, there's an island in Indonesia called Batam, which is a free trade zone near Singapore. But because it's a free trade zone, it's near Singapore and Malaysia, it's um, a thriving sex tourism spot. It's the main reason for people to go there. And there's a lot of trafficked um, kids for sex there. So I wanted to go and do a story about the sex trade of children in Batam and um, quickly realised that it would be done undercover. <laughs> Um, with a hidden camera. So, you know, 
SBS sent me off with their finest equipment, <laughs> which was a, a backpack with little rivets. One was a, this is, you know, 2005 or something. One was a camera, one was a mic. And in the backpack was this tape machine that when you ejected it, it went zzz, <laughs> and then yeah, put that. the tape in. And which there was one very sticky moment in a, um, when I was undercover in a brothel in the toilet, which wasn't very sealed, trying to change the tape, trying to unravel and going. <laughs> it was, that was actually quite terrifying. Um, anyway, so I went to Batam uh, without a visa, and it was kind of standard at Dateline. Like you just go, you'd, you'd, you wouldn't apply to the Indonesian government and say we want to expose the you know government collusion in the trafficking of children for sex in Batam, but. So I went as a tourist um, and ended up spending a month there because I just had to wait and wait and wait. And it, like Mark, I always worked alone doing stuff like that, but had a fixer. So, you know, quickly realised I had to um, find a way in. And, I, you know, maybe it would have been better if I was a man, actually, to do that story um, because going to a brothel as a woman wasn't an easy thing to do either. But I met some people there who were sort of these renegade social workers who were trying to help kids. They'd run sex ed classes in brothels for the kids. They, you know, the, the, the mafia who run them, which were often government and police as well, would allow them in to do that much or to give condoms to the girls or whatever. And they agreed to let me come along and pretend to be a social worker from Singapore. So I went with them a few times and met these girls who they had in mind and I'll show you the first clip but the the where we're going just to show you how overt it was this was a rehabilitation center for former sex workers run by the government and it was actually just a string of brothels full of kids who'd been trafficked and there was very little there, there, you know there was not even a sign saying rehabilitation so that was that was so this is me going and meeting the girls for the first time terrible footage technology's come a long way but. <laughs> I'm on my way to this so-called rehabilitation center I can't go in as a journalist so I'm going in undercover as a social worker Ruli, the social worker who visits brothels, wants me to meet Lena and Deanna, two children who have been working there as sex slaves for eight months. She thinks they're around 14 years old. Sampai dia dibawa ke Batam, sama sekali tidak tahu dia usia berapa 10 tahun atau 15 tahun. Yang jelas saya dia belum mengalami menstruasi atau datang bulan uh, datang ke Batam pun tidak diketahui juga oleh orang tuanya bahwa dia akan kerja seperti yang dialami sekarang ini. The local mafia tightly controls this government built compound. I can't film openly here, so I'm going in with a hidden camera. The construction is barely finished on these brothels when the girls are purchased and they open for business. The girls are asleep. Ruli asks their friend Tia to wake them. <laughs> Tia doesn't want to be identified. She's only been here for a month, but is like a big sister to the girls. This is Lena. Now that she's awake, she comes and joins us. But Diana needs a little more coaxing. Tia says Lena is willing to escape, but Diana is afraid. Both Ruli and Tia try unsuccessfully to convince Diana. 
Rooley can't be seen helping the brothel's prize assets to flee. As a foreigner, I'm attracting more and more attention. For our safety, Rooley decides we have to go. This is Lena and Deanna on the porch of the brothel. Lena is on the left in red, and Deanna is next to her. They were brought here from the island of Madura by a trafficker and sold to this brothel for about $400 each. So it, it took a while to um, figure out how they were going to rescue them and meanwhile we had to, I had to make a whole film so we stayed, my fixer and I, he was a local, not a local guy but um, he was organising everything, stayed there and we had to, the danger wasn't apparent but it was everywhere so we stayed in a very expensive hotel which was difficult as a freelancer um, and sort of had to go dark so our names weren't there, no one knew we were there and we were finding people like we got a, a madam to come and talk to us undercover and slowly trying to build this story of what was happening without being found out and interviewing the police and everything so it was you know you're constantly on edge for the girls for the social workers and for yourself because you don't you don't know how things are going to run and um eventually we um their social workers organized the girls wouldn't leave without their relatives so um they brought uncles from their village to come when they were rescued they said they're not going to go without they didn't they thought they might be tricked again um and it, yeah, it took four weeks to do that and we sort of set up this thing where someone else, they got some other sort of gangsters on the island who were from the same island as the girls were from to come and face off the other dudes and it was all very complicated. But I couldn't go in there and there was a real risk, like the, the social workers lived there so if I'd have, if they sort of put a, a link back to me it would have um, really put them at risk in what they were doing and they did want to sort of continue working and saving girls. So... Um, they got other people to go in and rescue the girls and I hired a local cameraman to shoot what I'll show you next. So after that, we just quickly got off the island and back then it was sort of like, it didn't go on the internet, it didn't, you know, um, there was a feeling that we could somehow control the dissemination of this film, which was probably naive looking back, but at the time I, I don't know if it um, alerted the authorities on the island, but the, the social workers continued to work and managed to free um, a lot more girls. But this is a, a scene where they're being rescued. They've now arrived at the brothel and the girls know nothing of the rescue plan. <laughs> Lena is shocked to see her uncle. <laughs> <laughs> While Lena's uncle consoles her, in the other corner, the girls' release is being negotiated with the mummy and puppy, who maintain the girls were never coerced. Deanna has hidden out the back. Ashamed to be found here, she's terrified of how her uncle might react. Oh, my God. 
kita ombe sih makanya orang-orang itu kan terserah dia mau cari tamu mau penting kami nggak maksa tapi ndak on ini ndak on apapun ndak maksa biar siapa di sini yang anak tanya in the rooms where they were forced to have sex with guests the girls pack their belongings sangkian gue ya no nah sandal nana kayak nangis Ya untuk salin-salinan aja. Aku kok kalau lorek kena. Aku nak enggak ada antren. Dari kemarin kena lo pulang kena. Iyalah. Enggak apa-apa nak. Cina. Diana's shame is compounded by the fact that she has no money to show for the eight months she spent here. Ada uang. Iyalah. Ada apa nak? Diana says goodbye to the people who have been her family for the past eight months. Even to the puppy who imprisoned her. Diana finds Tia, her guardian angel, around the side of the brothel. Wow, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to um, just talk a little bit about uh, your, your feelings towards ethics of um, going undercover, the dangers of being, you know, to yourself, but also to your subjects of, you know, either being caught out or, and I know that Mark was going to talk to that as well. Um, I, you know, I don't know, Mark can probably talk more about it, but I suppose that your biggest fear is to do harm, like the whole point is that you're going there to try and help people or expose something or get some message out, so, but when your presence can cause, it creates a risk. It's it's nerve wracking and that day was terrible. It was terrible not being able to be there after sort of watching this and being a part of this being set up for so long. And to a certain extent they were doing it because we were there and um, you know they would have rescued them but they could have never afforded to bring their uncles from Madura and as soon as they said that they wouldn't leave unless their family came then we made that happen, you know, Dateline made that happen. Whether that's ethical or not, I don't particularly care, but I wasn't gonna walk away and leave them there after that time. But yeah, and, and the big thing was to the, the social workers who would be left behind. And so often you, you know, I think I told Paige this morning, I did a story in Ethiopia after a very bloody election um, years ago, and my fixer who helped me a lot had to flee the country and he's now living in the US and he had to seek asylum there because of what he did with me, taking me to the opposition and taking me to all these places and um, involving him so deeply in the story. I got to just leave and put my story on air, but he had to leave his old mother and everything he knew to go and live somewhere else. So that's, you know, a pretty difficult thing. But yeah, anyway, you have things to say. Oh, yeah, I have nothing to add on that, just because yeah. we're moving oh, along, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, um, um, Olivia and I, 
have spoken about it before, where people talk about you know the trauma of doing these sort of stories, mm -hmm. and, and I think we share this view. Mm -hmm. The trauma is not oh we saw dead body. I mean, I, I honestly I d don't react at all to dead body parts. So I just look at the dead body part. Right, it doesn't emotionally affect you. But the emotion of the uh, walking away from these sort of situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the person that is the subject of the film or people that have helped you, uh, the people that are in fear and remain in fear, um, is absolutely a, a, a residual trauma, mm -hmm. much more so than uh, violence in itself, mm -hmm. actually, in its mm -hmm. which is sort of a neat segue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. The um, I'll, I'll just give a Do quick, quick yeah. setup uh, to Rohingya. Uh, the Rohingya were fleeing um, uh, genocide in Burma. And uh, uh, no shortage of Thai boatmen were on, on hand to offer them um, uh, passage basically to Thailand or, or uh, Myanmar, uh, to, uh, to Malaysia. These people had everything stolen from them by the peace-loving Burmese monks. Um, so they basically had nothing. So what they did was they'd uh, be smuggled on down payments. Uh, they'd be told, well, listen, if you can't pay now, give us, I think you could get on a boat for about 50 bucks. Uh, you'll owe us two and a half thousand. We'll get you, you know, to these special clearing centres, they'd tell them, special clearing centres, and then you'll be released and you'll make it, blah, blah, blah. And you pay along the way, or when you get there, you'll work and you'll pay us back. All sounds very nice. Um, and now, of course, what happened was, many thousands of them, this is not on a small scale, many thousands, were, were put on boats, were smuggled into Thailand, and into jungle camps, where they'd be held in pits and uh, bamboo cages, and they would torture, torture them and call their uh, cousins or their mothers or their brothers uh, back in Burma uh, on the phone. This is, you know, new technology is, is for us. And that if, you, if you're a woman, you'd be raped. If you're a man, you'd have your arms broken or your feet broken or your teeth smashed in, and you'd then describe that to your relative. And then they would say, now, do you want to pay or not? Right, that's the question. Now, even desperate people somehow find more money, and so they would milk the, the, the life and the soul uh, out of these remaining refugees, and people would pay. If you didn't pay, they'd kill you. Um, if you couldn't pay the full amount, they'd keep you alive. So $100 would keep you alive for, for a week, and you could check it because they'd do it through Western Union. So up in the jungle, you'll wait, wait up Western Union, okay, you're alive, you stay alive. Oh, horrific, uh, that's not in this. But, but what happened was they discovered a couple of mass graves. The Thai authorities did this charade of being terribly surprised by it, and these mystery graves, hundreds of people in them. How did this happen, blah, blah, blah. No one was being fingered. No one was being accused, no one was being arrested. There was no witness. This guy in this clip is a witness. He was a guard. He was Rohingya himself, was a refugee. He became the camp guard. So he's, he was, felt compromised himself. He uh, fed, fed the refugees uh, and then he'd bury them. And he saw many of them killed. He gives this interview with me in the jungle and it's a horror story. You know, so I can't watch it still, actually, I can't watch it. Uh, what they did and what they did to the children and you know the whole guards. He then tells me, I said, well, where did you bury them? And he gives me this utterly bizarre story uh, that they're buried in the uh, personal graveyard of the people smuggler who has become very, very rich. Right? He's moved about 500 people through it, two grand. He's, got, you know, he's made a million bucks. Big new house, personal graveyard. Let's go to the personal graveyard, I say. Uh, he says, not a good idea. Right? They'll kill us. And so we sat down together and reached this, had this discussion. And we both real, and of course, you know, I play it because it gives rise to ethical issues, right? Well, should you do this or not? We had that ethical issue ourselves in the jungle. It was dangerous for him. Uh, um, it was dangerous for me. Uh, but we both thought uh, it was important to do. That is, go in front of the smuggler's house and tell the story of who's buried there. Now, we were hoping to do it in about 30 seconds. That's what, that's what we've discussed. But he more or less breaks down when we get there. So that's the intro. Thank you.
খবরসান মুদ্দা দেখা দিবা দিন হে দুল্লা তো বাজে মো খবরসান হন্নান হংলি হে মুদ্দা দেখা দিবা হন্নান তু জুইম গজে দে হেন দেখা দিম কেঙ্গুরি ফা সিদি মারে ফেলাই দে হেন তো সাবুত দিবা দিম বরাক লিডস আস অ্যাওয়ে ফ্রম দ্য ক্যাম্প ফার অ্যাওয়ে হি লিডস আস অফ দ্য মাউন্টেন এন্ড ডাউন টুওয়ার্ডস দ্য মেইন টাউন Padang Besar is the official crossing point between Thailand and Malaysia. It was the heart of the traffickers operations. The town mayor and his deputy have recently been arrested for their involvement in the trade. Whenever there was a load of two or three corpses, Barak would be driven through these streets at midnight towards a little used cemetery. Here a police station. <laughs> Near Barak is nervous driving down this road. The smuggler he worked for still lives here, still free, and perversely overlooking the graves of the Rohingya who died or were murdered in his camp. বেশি বেশি হইষ্ট হব বেশি ডুব হাইকন হইল কথা হয় বাদে মই গিয়ে আরা বলে বস করলে দেখিলে উদ মারি ফেলে আরারে ও মুরু দ আরা ইদিয়া ও হবরা এস এনি বুবু ডেট এনি ডেট ইনি ডেট হি হি এ কামি How many? 1 2 3 1 2 3 4 Rohingya? Uh, yes. All Rohingya? Yes, in all Rohingya. Oh, oh. Yes, in pain. I pain. In I pain. Pain. Who was your friend? His yes. Name? What was his name? Nam. 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 Sure, like you, Mamorovic. Mamorovic. I pain. In dues, class friend. Yes, Libby. Oof. Bishy hushed over. Bishy hushed over. Marifili. Boxing. You need to let me boxing. No money call. Yes, boxing. Dead. You need. Oof. Barak knew half the people he buried and could identify the rest. Shot. With his own hands he buried at least 20 here but he believes there are dozens more Rohingya buried by others perhaps 100 Burak's former boss still lives in one of the houses overlooking the graves buried here to avoid evidence of the dead being found at his jungle camps no matter what the threat is now to his life barak is determined to directly accuse those he blames for the deaths of his friends and fellow rohingyans if there is a legal system that will listen chunjualam zobo ronja happy sure zobo dala dala Sure. For Thai authorities, the biggest mass grave to be found in this whole sordid story may not be on a remote mountain top, but in the middle of town and still under the guard of the perpetrators. Somebody come here or let's go. Let's go. Let's must go. Let's go. As we leave, Barak's fears are confirmed. as two traffickers cars emerge from the house towards us yeah. 
Is that the broker? A sign of their brazen impunity in this town. No one car, two, three car already. Two, three. Now, yeah. now come to two, three car. Three cars know? already. Yes, coming. yes, come in. He wants yeah. to shoot. So you do know this, this is seriously a, area. This, this is one this very, very dangerous. dangerous. Um, the, the, the people in the car at the end, they thought I was going to go, I just need one more shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they did. <laughs> yeah, they did think that. I was going, I promise you, I don't want to get the hell out of here. Uh, very intense. Uh, very intense. So, uh, I don't know what else to say about it now, but, you know. I, think, I mean, I think, well. You know, uh, well, okay, we, he's we all right. He's all right. So, right. really, the re this is the issue, and it's a common one, right? You're facing... You are absolutely putting someone's life at risk. Uh, we were all terrified of, of going there, and he was. Um, but at the very least, I think it was a risk I shared, and we together made the decision as to why it was important. And uh, it's uh, no one had been prosecuted. Right? So here we have, first time on tape, a witness in the camp who can witnessed the murders, bodies, if you're interested, the useless government of Thailand, there are bodies, there they are, and he names them. And then, thank God, uh, bless him, he turns and points to the house. Right? And thankfully, Four Corners left that shot in against the uh, legal advice. That house with the blue roof, that is the man that did it. Right? Now, uh, it doesn't have a happy ending to this degree. Uh, uh, effectively, nothing has happened. No prosecution. No prosecution. Uh, and the reason that boy decided to talk was that he had already made the decision that he wanted something justice done uh, and he tried to go to the police. Obviously not the local police because they were all on the take. He went to the national police and he thought uh, uh, for three months that something was going to happen and then he realised nothing was going to happen. And I was sort of lucky. I was turned up at around that time when he realised nothing was going to happen. He's okay, he, he, uh, but he wasn't okay. I, I mean, I have to be, you know, these, these are very tense things. You put something like that to air, uh, it's, it's traumatising to put it to air, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, a, a huge weight, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, um, thank God. We took certain steps to protect him and get him out of there and get him somewhere else, and other people were trying to get him out of the country. He wasn't out of the country when it went to air. I think it's pretty clear who he is, even though, you know, I'm not a fan of this sort of... Uh, I think it's weak, you know. It's like trying to look like you're a good guy concerned, but you're really not doing anything for the person. It's for the audience's mm -hmm. comfort, not mm -hmm. for the actual safety. You know, so I'm not a fan of that. Uh, but if you've got someone who's brave enough to say, and, and they believe it's important, which he did, mm -hmm. and he wants to do it, well, I'll be with him and we'll do it. Uh, he's now left the country. Um, and the man in the blue house is still in the blue house. <laughs> that must be a bit maddening. Uh, yeah, it was. I have a very unusual postscript to that. Um, I did think, well, as often, you know, you think you're going to change the world. I did think that was going to change the world. It didn't. <coughs> but we did have contact with the head of uh, Thailand's police, national police because this kid had been put in, in touch with him. I was then in touch with this fellow. And uh, he said, get, he was more or less saying, get the evidence and I'll act, right? So I actually thought the day after that went to air, the guy would be arrested and the whole thing would be blown up. Nothing happened, right? And I'm sitting there just going, this is just weird, right? weird. And it went on two months, three months, weird. <coughs> About four or five months later, I get a phone call, a guy uh, through a translator, he had a woman with him, but he's a Thai man, and I'm going, you where, you where? It's Melbourne Airport, he's at Melbourne Airport, and there's this man wants to speak to you. And it was the head of the Thai police force seeking asylum. asylum. Mm. Um, and he came to Australia, and he, he, I met him, and he said, uh, I tried with all of my uh, heart and all of my courage, but I, I, I couldn't do it, and then they were turning on me. So he's actually, well, I think it's been published somewhere, but he's the head of the Thai police force over this issue uh, is now you know, more or less hiding in 
Australia. Wow, mm. that's extraordinary. Mm. Well, um, <laughs> I told you it was going to be a little bit heavy. Um, you, all of you, I think I really take my hat off to all of you for your bravery and your um, empathy. Um, and I think it might be a good time to open up to audience uh, for a quick Q&A. Hi. Hi. I have a question um, subsequent to that last episode and clip. Are there stories that have made a difference? Uh, yes, um, but uh, not as many as you'd like. And personally, I find it... This almost broke me, actually, that story. That story was... The first half of that story was in Burma with the Rohingya and it was essentially forecasting there's going to be a, a genocidal massacre. That's what the point of the story was. And it was a tough story to get in to do and nothing happened. And then they were all killed. Everyone I filmed, everyone I filmed uh, was killed. Like a year later. You know. So that one was particularly dispiriting. I've had a few victories. But not that many, you know. Ultimately, you don't. Well, it's never clear, you know. You don't know. You add to the load. Yeah, you don't know the impact, you know. There's never that sort of great moment. Oh, hooray! There's going to be an inquiry. I mean, it's rare, you know. You just throw it out there and and um, see what happens, mostly. Okay. Thanks. But you do it hoping that there will be, you know. And it does. It does add to. It does mm. add to a load. Mm. Like I think. A lot of people can get quite upset when they do stuff and it doesn't change the world mm. at first, but you kind of realise that it helps. Like with Aladdin, the guy on Manus Island in 2005, Julian Burnside was his lawyer, which was probably the main thing that got him out. But that, you know, then I did the story, then you know, all these little bits sort of come together and then one man's life is saved. Mm. You know? So it does happen. But oh, it's an incredible privilege. How many people can actually do something comprehensive mm. about an issue, you know. So if there's a sense a of frustration, much. pretty piss weak, right, you've got much more empowered than most people are to feel like you're well, it's like doing something. Sophie and Rahaf, yeah, you great. know, yeah, the yeah. woman, I think you talked about the woman yeah. in um, on Bangkok. Four cor- on Four Corners. Uh, yeah, and she just knew that there was something she could do. It wasn't, she didn't have a story commission, yeah. she wasn't... She, ju- she jumped on a plane. She with, got on a plane and got there. Within a day and got there and then effectively helped save the Saudi Arabian woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. spending amazing. her own money and just mm. take her own initiative. Mm. You know, and got to her in Bangkok from Sydney before anyone in Bangkok got to her. Mm. <laughs> like, she was contacting people in Bangkok, Human Rights Watch, different people saying, she's in transit, she's in this hotel, help her. Nothing was happening at a certain point. She went, got on a plane, I'm going to go. Yeah. Do you think there's like an assumption that... that you know, like what you were saying, that yeah, well, there's a system or that there's a whole bunch of people and it will be covered or, you know, like in James's situation, oh, you know, he'll be totally looked after by, you know, yeah. Department of Foreign yeah. Affairs yeah. and there's this kind of weird... Assumption. Yeah. yeah. As I say, you know, assumption's the mother mm. of all fuck-ups, mm. right? Well, <clears throat> one thing I can add to mine, my story is that when you read in the newspaper that an Australian has been arrested at any in any, any part of the world, and that they are receiving consular assistance. What that means in reality is a toothbrush, um, back issues of the local newspaper, and delivery of mail. It means nothing more than that. If you, and, and this is something that I think that probably most people don't understand, is that when you're overseas, if you do get into trouble, the Australian government will do nothing to help you, as a rule, unless the media kicks up a huge fuss and unless there's public opinion on your side. And that goes, that's right across the board. And I know, I know three or four Australians in jail now, still, who, will probably, who, are, who are as innocent as I was, or should I say there's no more evidence than they are guilty, that they are guilty than there was in my case. They are still in jail. They are still being told by the Australian Embassy and by lawyers and so on, be quiet, let quiet diplomacy work its wonders and you'll get out of here. Some of them are going to die in jail. One of them did die in jail while I was there, an Australian whose name was Giuseppe Nicolosi from um, Adelaide. No one has ever heard of Zippy, was his, what we called him. Zippy died in December 2017 of malnutrition and medical neglect in Presar prison at the same time as we were writing 
letters to Malcolm Turnbull, to Julie Bishop and to Ambassador Angela Corcoran saying if you don't do something to get Zippy out of jail and into a, an intensive care ward, he's going to die. Messages came back and this is all documented in emails. It's not our responsibility. Zippy died. Um, three or four months later, I became very ill myself. My weight went from 88, 89 kilos down to 69 kilos. I could have died. Um, fortunately, I knew people in the media. Fortunately, I had enough contacts to be able to kick up a bit of a fuss. But um, unless you have those contacts, you will be abandoned by your government. And I think that anybody who's the parent of a young man or woman who goes backpacking around the world, or anybody who knows somebody who is involved in business around the world, if you believe that you're, the government is going to step in and help you, it, you're misguided, basically. That's my experience. And, I've, and I've, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's the case. We shouldn't be scaring people out of doing this, though, if they <laughs> want to do it, because it's also a fantastically rewarding oh, yeah. thing to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. <laughs> but there are risks in everything. Um, I pose this question to Olivia. I guess um, being a woman, sometimes it can hinder your access to certain stories. Have you experienced that? Um, how have you combated it? And have you had to give up on stories because of it? I think um, mostly it's worked in my favour. Um, for a while, being underestimated was a really great thing, like having a small camera and being a young woman, as I was once. Um, you know, like I went to Iraq after the invasion and was walking around Saddam Hussein's palace with my little camera, um, you know, other events around that. But I wasn't a threat. I wasn't a big dude with a big camera. So it was like, oh, she can't be doing anything that serious. So it sort of um, was not a bad thing um, most of the time. But no, I didn't, I've never, yeah, being, yeah, being under, I might have been offended more than it standing in my way, like interviewing people, I've been patronised or whatever, but everyone does. <laughs> Journalists often get treated like you're some kind of irritant or cockroach or whatever by people in power <laughs> and you wear it. But no, I think it's, you know, it's sort of been fine, mostly. I said just a quick aside when we were talking earlier how you said you rocked up to Manus Island and, you know, you're around all these men mm. who have been on an island for five years and you said you felt completely safe and completely... Um, Protected. Yeah, protected and I they'd been that. in prison for five years so a lot of them hadn't even left the um, detention center but it was a it was a moment where I went where I, we were trying to get to sleep at 5 a.m and I went oh hold on oh, <laughs> I'm a woman alone with 423 men <laughs> many of whom will have been celibate for four years you know you do have those thoughts and I, I mentioned it I just said it out loud to Jared the young pastor who I was with and he said oh, I'll sleep in the doorway <laughs> so he lay down and went to sleep and I just lay there going yeah, right <laughs> you know, and I didn't I didn't you know like the men were lovely but you you do assess there's you, you it'd be stupid not to assess all risks um but uh, you know I was taken care of so like the men during the day this is a total aside nothing to do with danger to do with beautiful humans but it was boiling hot you know in these things where we were and this guy would bring in the well water. They dug wells, so they had water to drink, and it was this brackish water, which was terrible for them, but it's all they had. And they were bringing in buckets of it for me to put my feet in to cool me down, and then this Afghani guy standing there with a piece of cardboard fanning me <laughs> while I'm like, <laughs> princess sweat queen. <laughs> and he brought in some long pants for me to change into, and I was like, shorts. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it was, it was great. It was beautiful. And it's sort of, it was, you know, I wrote something after that that I wanted to get out there about this care. But it's, a, you know, the media weren't interested. That wasn't the story mm. that anyone wanted to hear. So. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Um, my question is for the panel and anyone can choose to answer it. Um, when going to some of these um, foreign countries, um, with the language barrier and all the other logistical challenges. Um, based on your experiences, like what would you suggest some just list of things that would be handy in like where, who to talk to or how do you find out the critical people to talk to or the people who would have that knowledge 
not being from there, we would not have that local knowledge. So how do you, you know, deal with that kind of challenge and how do you figure out the logistics um, in an in a unknown land? Uh, I basically look, look, look for journalists, look for activists and uh, spend a few days. I mean, you've you got to do it quickly. Uh, I tend not to do it ahead of time. Current affairs tends to be very programmed now because you're flying four people to do it. But I find someone and then I meet their cousin and I don't like their cousin, but I, you know, who did you go to school with? And in most countries, you actually can work your way through a food chain pretty quickly. It's quite... It's a great fun test, actually. You can get to very powerful people very quickly, starting with one. And uh, so, yeah, but generally the, the cousins of talent is what I do. So I know who I'm going to for in the first place and then I meet their cousin and they're often very good or they know someone who's good. And it can, I, rec I used to say, and I, I, I don't film anything for four days, so I've changed that, but that's what I used to say. In four days, I reckon I can find just about anybody just working that way and sitting around having a smoke and a coffee. And not going through formal channels, like just asking anyone and everyone the questions, like um, expecting the world and, you know, like, mm. do you know anyone who can introduce me to this person? And then everyone knows everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you, James. <clears throat> thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Mark. And to Jen Peterm, please thank our guests. <clears throat>